Hello, and I would like to welcome you to the Science Bulletins at m h Google Hangout. Uh, warm, warm forecast for coral reefs. And uh, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us on Google Plus and on YouTube. Uh, we invite you to join the conversation to share comments and questions uh, in uh, both of those locations. And now I'm going to turn this over to Laura Allen, the senior editorial producer for Science Bulletins and the producer of the data visualization that we're going to be discussing today. Hi, everybody. Uh, Mindy and I would love to welcome you to our hangout today. Uh, we're both from the Science Bulletins program at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. And our program develops video and visualization that explores scientific research and discoveries about the natural world. Well, we're here today to release a new data visualization. Um, it's focused on the risks posed to coral reefs by warming ocean temperatures over the past few years. And we're also going to look at a prognosis of, for coral reefs in the coming century as climate change continues. What we're going to do in the next 45 minutes is show some excerpts from this piece. Uh, we're going to explain the scientific data you're seeing. And we're just going to give you a broader context to it so that if you're an educator, participating with us today, maybe at a museum or in a more formal education setting. Uh, the, the discussion today will help give you a greater context to what you're seeing and help you learn a little bit more about coral reefs in general and their health. So we're happy to have two coral reef specialists from NOAA with us today, Mark Aiken of NOAA's Coral Reef Watch and Ruben Van Hoydonk from NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory down in Miami, and Ruben's also with uh, the University of Miami as well. Um, they're going to help us dive deeper into this. Uh, these scientists work really intimately with the tools and the data that enable, a, enable monitoring, prediction, and protection of coral reef systems. So they're the, the perfect ushers for um, this information. Uh, before I let Mark and Ruben introduce themselves a little bit more fully, I'd just like to tell you where you can access the visualization. It's currently playing in our Hall of Biodiversity here at AOM and H, uh, as well as about a dozen other museums and science centers that subscribe to the Science Bulletin's uh, BioBulletin content stream. Uh, it's also on amnh.org, and we've also fla uh, formatted the piece to play on a spherical screen. So those of you with us from uh, the uh, Science on a Sphere network can use this visualization as an auto-run piece or as a live programming element that can enhance uh, teaching and discussion about uh, adaptations, about ocean systems, about um, modeling and observations and how those work together to understand our changing Earth. Uh, this, this piece would be a good element for that as well. Um, links to both Science on a Sphere versions as well as the mnh.org versions are on our Google Plus page, so please look there. Um, and speaking of NOAA, we'd like to thank them. They're the, uh, they fund the, this uh, educator outreach and they fund the visualization production of the series that this visualization is part of. So all the while, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, you can jump in at any time and ask them, so uh, don't hesitate. All right, so Mark and Ruben, uh, would you like to say a little bit about what you do and your particular areas of research interest? Great, well, Mark? I'm glad to be here with you. I'm Mark Aiken. I am the coordinator of NOAA's Coral Reef Watch. Uh, we're located in College Park, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. And what we do is to use satellites to look at the sea surface temperatures that cause coral bleaching, as well as other uh, environmental stresses to coral reefs. Uh, we've done work on ocean acidification as well, use uh, the, the current satellite images. We use uh, some short-term or seasonal climate forecasts that you'll be seeing a, an image from later on, uh, as well as doing some work on a longer time scale with uh, climate change class models. So one of the important things that will come out of this and you'll be hearing is the, the impact that climate change is already having on coral reefs around the world and that's what makes this so important. So glad to be with you and uh, over to you Ruben. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Ruben van Hoydonk and I uh, uh, work in, uh, in Miami and my work focuses mostly on long-term projections of impacts on coral reefs, uh, impacts that can be from warming or from ocean acidification. 
And to do that, I use global uh, climate models, fully coupled models, earth system models, but sometimes also regional models. And we'll show some of the projections for uh, different scenarios up to 2100 later today. OK, great. So, so let's just get started. Um, as we all know, coral reefs are uh, really important ecosystems. They're um, among the most diverse ecosystems in the world. They're critical as uh, sources of food and shelter and nursery uh, areas for a, a wide variety of creatures in the ocean. Um, and one of the, um, their particular um, aspects is that reefs are very uh, narrowly adapted to a, a narrow range of conditions. They um, only can tolerate a certain range of temperatures or salinities or water clarity conditions. And this is why uh, ocean warming has a, such a, a powerful potential to impact them. So why don't we start off by uh, just hearing a little bit from Mark about how warming in particular affects corals. Um, why, what can happen when water temperatures exceed that threshold that uh, corals are adapted to? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Corals, it, it, it is nice that corals live in such beautiful places. That's sort of the environment that you see them in. They're, they're warm, they're clear, they're beautiful. Part of the reason they're able to live in these clear waters with so little nutrients and so little for them to feed on is because the corals actually have algae living inside their tissues. Uh, these algae called zooxanthellae uh, help, uh, help the corals by giving them their food. They help them to grow the skeletons, those massive uh, rock uh, structures that they form. The Great Barrier Reef is one of these places that you can easily see from space as, as a single large uh, community or ecosystem that's been developed uh, by, uh, by the corals. But because this is such a, a tenuous relationship between the coral and the, the zooxanthellae, these microscopic algae, they're adapted to do the best at temperatures that are right up near the thermal maximum of what these corals normally see. And so if you get a warm time during a year, the temperatures get too high, it actually causes the corals to start to bleach. Now the bleaching it has nothing to do with what you'd use in your laundry. Bleaching is what happens when the corals actually expel the zooxanthellae. They'll spit them out into the water column and when they expel the zooxanthellae, what happens is it leaves the skeleton looking white. You're looking right through the clear tissues where the corals normally reside I mean where the uh, algae normally reside, and you're seeing right through to the, to the coral skeleton. And we have some pictures of that. Yeah, maybe we can That's bring right. those up. Or if you want to br start with the June pictures, um, those uh, are, uh, these are some pictures of a coral bleaching event that happened in Thailand in uh, 2010. Um, the, the, the temperatures in 2010 grew very high, ar Around the world, we had bleaching events that went on in all of the world's oceans. And the result of that were corals that were, were bleached stark white. And uh, the, the thing is, when you've got one of these bleaching events, if it lasts for a short time, the corals can, can actually recover. But if it's severe enough, if it's long-lasting enough, the corals will die either from the impact of the temperature from the loss of uh, the food that they provide or from diseases that kick in. So here you're seeing some, uh, some massive corals, especially bleached, the, the different uh, colors of the skeletons after the tissues are gone. If you want to switch to one of the others, the, the branching corals are especially stark and, and, and white. Um, and, and then the, uh, the, the final picture, if you want to put that July one back up, um, we'll, we'll show what the branching corals look like after they've died and the algae have overgrown them. All right, so yes. here we have uh, this image from July in 2010. Right, that and July one is what's happened after the corals, the branching corals have died. Uh, you see all of that brown in the foreground are the corals after they've died and, al and a, a different kind of algae, Philometus algae, has grown over the outside of the corals and uh, uh, at this point, those corals are, are dead. They're not producing anything for the reef. It's a, a, a very unfortunate situation for the reef that uh, is a real decline in the, the health of that ecosystem. So how do, we, how do we measure the heat stress that 
triggers bleaching. Uh, you mentioned satellites, and I'm, I'd be interested in um, sharing to our listeners just how much satellite monitoring has really revolutionized our ability to uh, keep track of, of where corals are at risk and where they might be at risk in the future. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the real re revolution in this was getting a long enough cord to put on the end of that thermometer so you could hang it from the satellite. Just kidding. This is all done with imagery. You're looking at infrared images of the ocean surface, and you can actually see the heat coming back up off of the water. By looking at the, the warm areas of the surface, you can, you can actually tell very precisely what the temperature of the ocean is. As I said, when the temperatures get too high, the corals start to bleach. And there's a threshold that these corals uh, have. First, there, there's something that we refer to as the maximum monthly mean. That's the average temperature of the normal warm, the warmest month of the year that you find where those corals are living. And this varies. If you're in Florida, it's a, a lower temperature than if you're in Curacao. It's a you know, different temperature in uh, Australia than it is uh, in Papua New Guinea. As you go around the globe, you have different, different thresholds. When the temperatures get above that threshold, it starts to stress the corals. And then as that threshold is exceeded for a long time, the stress really starts to build up. And what you'll be seeing in the animation, the thermal stress index that we're using here is something called our degree heating weeks. It's how many weeks that, that the temperature has stayed above the threshold for bleaching uh, times the number of uh, degrees that they are above it. So if it's one degree above the threshold, it, you get a value of one. If it's two degrees above, you get a value of two. If it stays that way for two weeks, you get a value of four. And so that's how you go from the, the mild bleaching, which is anything less than four, to the, uh, the more moderate bleaching when you get above four and up toward eight. And above eight, you start to see major bleaching and uh, mortality of corals. The corals start to die from the thermal stress. So I'm going to just pause here and, and play um, a segment from the visualization where we do show um, this accumulated heat stress. And we don't, um, in our visualization, we don't include the numbers. We just have a particular scale that highlights uh, when the heat stress is enough to induce mild bleaching, when it's uh, enough to induce uh, more severe bleaching and when it's enough to uh, potentially cause coral death. So what you're seeing here is a series of weekly averages from 2013 uh, that show what Mar uh, Mark was sharing, where we're seeing hot spots that uh, might have particular um, negative impacts to corals. And right here you're seeing some warming in the North Pacific that had uh, a northwestern Pacific that had a major impact in the areas around Guam and the Marianas Islands. You're, you're seeing it there in the... Uh, Let's see. Let's uh, show that. Now it's in November. So right about there, you're seeing it up in, uh, in the Pacific, in the, in the tropical, reg tropical and subtropical region of the western Pacific. And that, that effect caused a, a lot of bleaching in Guam and the, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. So if I, I'm going to scrub forward here and show um, an image of the accumulated heat stress, uh, an, an annual maximum for the entire year. So this is a composite of all the areas that received heat stress across the ocean. Um, so 2013, um, how did corals fare? I mean, it, Mark, it looks like there was some serious high temperatures in certain arenas, and 2013 was the fourth warmest year on record. It was the fourth warmest year on record, and uh, you know, depending on which of the records you look at, it may have been tied for that, or, or a little warmer, a little colder, but the, the, the idea is it was, again, one of the warm years, and we keep seeing this. All of the, uh, the ten warmest years on record, except for one, were since 2000, uh, and that one was in 1998. And uh, in this one, in 2013, what you're seeing is what we normally see these years with, a, with some areas with a lot of thermal stress and of course as I said there was a lot of bleaching that occurred around, uh, around Guam. There was some bleaching on the west coast of uh, Australia as well. But it, all in all it really was not a bad year for corals. Um, 2014 is looking, well we'll see. So far it hasn't been bad but it could be getting worse and we'll be talking about that shortly. 
So let's let's look back to 2010. That's the year from the Thailand pictures that uh, we were showing earlier. Um, we have here um, a comparison between um, 2010, which was the hottest year on record, and 2013. And what we're seeing here in these images are only the areas of heat stress that coral reefs experience. So we took the coral reefs areas and got rid of the the all of the heat stress that was affecting areas that did not have coral reefs present and only are showing the heat stressed reefs. Um, so as we play this forward, we can see that in 2010, um, we had a very, very severe uh, bleaching year for corals. That's right. And you can already see it there around the Philippines, uh, around Thailand and, and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, there was a lot of bleaching that went on in there. There was some bleaching that occurred in uh, the central Indian Ocean. Uh, we had significant bleaching going on in the Caribbean, especially along the uh, Windward and, and uh, Leeward Islands. Um, and uh, there also was some bleaching across the central Pacific. So it was not a good year for corals at all. And and. And these types of mass bleaching events, Mark, they, at this rate, they're occurring every five years on average, would you say? More or less. It depends on where in the world you're looking at, but, but yeah, and if you consider that a major bleaching event, it may take decades for the, cor for the reef to recover. Well, once you get to this point that you're seeing events happening, you know, more than twice a decade, these corals just don't have a chance to bounce back from events of that magnitude. Um, some areas haven't been hit quite so frequently, and especially haven't been hit by really big events that often. Um, the, the Caribbean so far has been hit the worst uh, repeatedly. Uh, you can see the warming that's there in 2010 in the, in the Eastern Caribbean especially. Um, but uh, the, these events are just coming too quickly and they're getting more frequent and more intense. So. So how can we use uh, Coral Reef Watch uh, satellite products to help anticipate when bleaching might occur? And, and what, what can reef managers use with that information? So if, if we know that there's going to be uh, a bleaching year like 2010 uh, unfold as the, the season goes on, how can the products uh, help mitigate those stressors? Well, so the first thing is that in, in having these satellite images providing people with information, it gives them a little bit of lead time of what's going to be going on on the coral reefs. The lead time is fairly short because the, you're already looking at what's happened and you're, the corals take a little while, one to three weeks, to respond to whatever level you've reached. But you're already there or getting there once the, the satellite images start to, to show up. So at that point, you're at the response phase. You're, you know, reef managers are having to go out and deal with an event that's already happening. And in the process of doing that, uh, they can perhaps reduce other stressors going on to reefs. These are short-term things. In the case of 2010, the uh, governments of both Malaysia and Thailand actually banned all liveaboard dive boat trips out into the Andaman Sea uh, coral reefs during that big event. Uh, they said, you know, we don't know if having the big dive boats going out there is going to have a major impact or not, but we have to do what we can to help out. So it, when you're in that sort of crisis mode, it, it's short term. It's reducing other stresses of various sorts. If disease outbreaks are going on, you can, you can look at uh, uh, doing things to reduce the transfer of disease from one place to another, things of that sort. In a longer term, what's useful is knowing which reefs bleach in these years as compared to others, knowing which corals bleach as compared to others, you know, which areas are more resilient and which areas are more, um, uh, more vulnerable to bleaching, helps managers to better protect those areas that are most resilient to try and give those coral reefs a real fighting chance uh, when the next event happens. Okay. So um, let's think about uh, going next to a longer term outlook. Um, and I'd like to um, bring in Ruben at this point. Um, both of you, um, Ruben and Mark, actually were involved in some recent studies that used climate models to anticipate where reefs might um, experience stress in the future. So um, 
Ruben, can you start by talking a little bit about what um, you've recently worked on and what the outlook um, might be if uh, emissions continue to proceed at the pace they're proceeding, um, what might be the outlook for coral reefs uh, in the coming century? Okay, so to, to analyze that or to project those long-term reef futures, what I did, I used an ensemble, an average of all uh, currently available uh, of the current generation climate models. And with those climate models, they project uh, sea surface temperatures into the future on, on core scales, scales of uh, about 100 to 300 kilometers wide. Um, and so that temperature data then I use to calculate degree heating weeks um, and then uh, project when reefs will start bleaching. So project when degree heating weeks will start hitting eight. Um, and, uh, and then as a threshold I said, okay, reefs need some time to recuperate after, after a major bleaching event but we don't know how long that is. So I just said as a very, very, like a point where we can imagine that reefs cannot, cannot provide the functions that we're used to seeing anymore uh, when they bleach 10 times in a decade. So that is set as a threshold. And uh, when I project that for the current, uh, for the emission scenario that we're currently tracking on, then the reefs, the futures for the reefs look pretty pretty bleak with but there are some locations where bleaching will occur much later than other locations and that's the that's the good news I guess so um, uh, I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna pull up this image uh, right here uh, this is the projection that Ruben was discussing um, can can you just walk us through some of the patterns you'll see this this um, this was made by uh, projecting that heat stress far into the future and what we see here are pixels that indicate where reefs are located. These don't look exactly like the, um, the fine scale um, mapping of coral reefs that we showed earlier in the piece because this was uh, projected by a model and it has a coarser resolution for those reefs. But what we're seeing here is the areas of where and when coral reefs are going to be expected if con uh, climate change emission uh, climate change continues on the pace that it is if emissions continue to climb at, at current rates uh, where and when we are seeing um, bleaching on an annual basis and how soon some areas will bleach on an annual basis uh, versus other areas so if you could just walk us through some of the patterns we're seeing that would yeah. be useful um, so this is uh, this is the projected year when uh, of the onset of annual bleaching and then bleaching set at eight degree heating weeks or more. Um, and one of the clear patterns that we're seeing is that there is a latitudinal gradient, meaning that the reefs in the western, uh, in, in the Pacific, in the equatorial Pacific, will start bleaching soonest on an annual basis, uh, with some reefs already before 2030. So that is uh, within, within 15 years, they'll start experiencing annual bleaching events. Um, luckily, then the, the reefs somewhat further to the north or south will, uh, will start bleaching uh, later with some reefs past 2060. Um, and for instance, on the Great Barrier Reef, the most southern part of the Great Barrier Reef is expected to start bleaching annually in about 2070 under the under the most severe emission uh, uh, scenario so where we put most amount of carbon into the atmosphere um, and what are the other what might other areas be that will see um, annual bleaching later and why uh, might those areas not be experiencing bleaching as soon as the others well, so, so uh, maybe, uh, can you show the, uh, the Caribbean? Sure, I'm going to have to do that on the, uh, the flat. So let me okay. switch that up here. Um, so so there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple different re rationales for where, why we see these patterns. Uh, one of them is, and uh, we assume that the trade winds in the tropics are going, or some of the models show that the trade winds in the models um, 
uh, in, in the Pacific, in the equatorial Pacific, are going to weaken under, uh, under future warming. And um, because the trade winds weaken there, you'll have less upwelling, meaning that it's, it's going to be uh, uh, the, the temperature change is going to be greatest there. Um, and so, so that's one of the rationales. Then another one might have to do with how much variability you see in, uh, in annual temperatures. Because um, if that variability is a lot bigger, then the temperature change over time uh, plays, a, plays a little bit of a, a smaller role. You need more temperature change to annually cross your thresholds. Um, but so that's, that's in a nutshell most uh, explains most of the um, the patterns that we see. And um, how do how should we think about these areas? These sort of um, temporary refugia—that's how you're characterizing them. These sort of temporary havens from early bleaching. Um, does a map like this help us? Uh, does it affect our conservation priorities? What what? How might this affect how? we go about uh, protecting and, and considering coral reefs in different locations around the world? Well, so, actually, you can, there's no clear answer for that, um, because you might, you might think that the areas that are going, going to be hit by annual bleaching first, that they deserve most of our uh, efforts to conserve, and maybe localized efforts there will have the biggest payoff. But then again, maybe some of these temporary refugia that will bleach 20, 30 years later, maybe we should focus our, our efforts on those. And because that's where reefs have the most chance, the most time to adapt, maybe uh, putting nurseries there and, 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 and putting more new corals there in, in the waters will have a bigger effect. So there's two ways of thinking about it. Some, uh, some locations need our actions now, and some locations it might pay off over time to, uh, to conserve them. So before we get to adaptation, which I'm glad you brought that up, because I think that's, that's a really interesting aspect of, of this story, um, I'd like to just uh, show you a, a different scenario. One of the uncertain factors is obviously how many, um, how much emissions will rise in the future. And so this image that we made as an additional image um, shows a different scenario that we did not use in the visualization. Um, Ruben, can you talk a little bit about what um, the 6.0 scenario represents and, uh, in, and how that might affect what kind of future uh, coral reefs might have? Yeah, uh, under the current generation of climate models, they're, um, they're all forced with four, one of four different emission scenarios. And these different emission scenarios lead to different concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And uh, these different concentrations, at 2100, they add so much extra energy to a square meter of the Earth and that's expressed in watts, and so these, these numbers that you see is 8.5 or 6.0, that's, that's the watts per meter square added to every square meter on, on the Earth by the greenhouse gases uh, in 2100. And so, uh, so RCP 6.0 uh, uh, represents a pathway of emissions with, with markedly reduced emissions compared to RCP 8.5. But what's, what's interesting to know is that currently we're emitting more than, uh, RCP, and than what we're projected in RCP 8.5. Uh, but, so if we reduce our, our emissions, you see a major shift in the timing of, of these annual bleaching events. With, uh, and it could, for some locations, that could be 20 or 30 years later. What's interesting to see, though, is that the, the, the patterns uh, where you see uh, bleaching sooner around the equator than further away from the equator, that those patterns remain the same. It's just the timing is, is, set up, is, is offset. What is interesting to know, that, though, is that even in RCP 6.0 or RCP 4.5, no reefs escape the fate of annual bleaching before 2100. 
That's that's really that's in intense. Um, I, I'd also like to pick up on that concept a little later when we think about the other stressors to reefs. Um, but before we do that, let's let's dial back to this idea of adaptation. Um, so both of you. Um, well, Mark, I know, has, and I were talking about um, the capacity of corals to adapt mm -hmm. to some amount of climate warming. Um, and I'd love, I'd love it if, Mark, you could just say a little bit about what some of the recent evidence is showing about um, how corals might be able to adapt and, and to talk a little bit about how and what the limits of their adaptation might be. What do we know right now? Yeah, we, we've got some idea, and if we can bring up the first uh, of the two frames that I was going to do, the uh, adaptation happening uh, at uh, RCP6, uh, this gives you an idea of what we've found, and, and it was quite interesting as we were doing our modeling study, which is a study similar to what uh, Ruben was doing, but a you know, slightly different approach to it, a slightly different model, and one of the things we were looking at was the potential for adaptation, and we did something interesting. We we, we looked to the basics of our assumptions of why coral bleach at the temperature they do. And what we find is that corals are bleaching at different temperature in different locations. And the, the products that we have are all based on the assumption that they're adapted to the temperatures from around the late, the, the late 1980s when the satellite record got started. So we're comparing against that time. If we instead go back and we look at the model and we say, let's assume that the corals are adapted to temperatures that were present at the beginning of the instrumental record, back in the early part of the modeling study, which is around 1900, and we project forward. Well, what that actually shows us is with the amount of warming that we've had, the um, temperatures should get up to the level that there's major bleaching going on by very early in the 21st century. In other words, we should be seeing a lot more bleaching than we are now. Yeah. So if instead what we did was we said, all right, so let's make the assumption that the corals are adjusting to these temperatures. There are different forms of adaptation, so different forms of, uh, uh, of acclimation, different things that corals can do. And we, don't have time to get into all the, the, the different types of, of responses, but this ability to adapt to higher temperatures allows them to move to a, a higher temperature regime. So that's the difference on this graph between the, the gray plots, the, the, the dotted and, and, and uh, solid gray lines that are a little bit to the left and the one to the black on the right. The one on the black on the right is assuming a later climatology and so what we see is that we've actually seen evidence that the corals have adapted to higher temperatures. So with this in mind, what this doesn't tell us is exactly how fast and it certainly doesn't tell us how far we're going to be going. Uh, that's that. There are limitations to what a modeling study like this can provide, and there are some experiments people are running to try and find this out. We know that they can only go so fast. We just don't know how fast that is. We also know that there's a limit to how much warming uh, they can adapt to. Uh, obviously, if you put them in boiling water, they're not going to survive. Somewhere between where we are and boiling, you know, you do reach that point where the corals are just going to die. But what we find is if we take this level of adaptation we've seen, and if we go ahead and go to the future adaptation, um, RCP 6 to 8 uh, figure, in that one what you're seeing is two different situations. The RCP 6, the uh, concentration pathway 6, uh, which is not quite as severe, and 8.5, which is on the right, which is more severe. And what you're seeing in those lines are different rates of adaptation. So those corals that are able to adapt the quickest actually are the ones, the lines that are at the lowest of both of those. So if they're able to quickly adapt, say within a 40 year time period, they can adapt to new temperatures, then you actually see relatively limited bleaching. If it takes longer, like 60, 80 years, more along the lines of what we've actually seen, you're still seeing significant bleaching, but not as much as if you don't build in adaptation. So this is a difference between what was, was in the, the study that Ruben and, and his colleagues did and, and ours is building in this adaptation. Now, 
as I said, the limitation of this, we don't know how, really how fast they're going to be able to adapt. We don't know how far they're going to adapt. Some corals are going to adapt well and others are not. So we know that we're going to have winners and losers in this process. And the question is, how many of these corals are going to be able to survive longer? The other thing that's very important here is if you look at this, and it, I'm not going to show these images, but you, you can go ahead and do the same thing for the, the uh, lower concentration pathways. As we go to them, you see less and less bleaching, especially when the adaptation is brought in. So the point here is that the corals are doing their bit to try to adapt to the higher temperatures. What we have to do is do our part to reduce the amount of CO2 and other heat trapping gases that we're putting into the atmosphere so that we aren't warming it as fast or as far as what we see in 8.5. As Ruben pointed out, you know, we're already tracking at, at rates of emissions higher than 8.5. So 8.5 is the worst case scenario and, and we continue to be worse than that worst case. So you mentioned that a, a coral adapting, uh, and that might be, we're not even sure, it could be a genetic adaptation, it could be uh, by shuffling the zoanthellae that they're symbiotic with, um, that uh, a coral adapting quickly, uh, 40 years is, is quickly. Um, so Ruben, when we were looking at your refugia areas and the, the delay of annual bleaching in those areas is only about 10 or 15 years, isn't that right? So it does give us a little bit more time for, it does give the corals a little bit more time for adaptation, but, but not necessarily that much. Mm -hmm. um, um, and yeah. the, I mean, what's the, what's the rub from that? I mean, how, um, I know that the, the idea of adaptation and how much, um, you know, this is, this is an area of debate. Every, uh, scientists are are not quite sure how how much adaptation is going to factor into these future outlooks. That that's correct. We know it's happening. Or just the most simple form of adaptation is where you kill off the weak ones or the ones that bleach first, and then you left over with a community, a population that is more resilient to t temperature stress. So we know it's happening, uh, but we don't know the rate. That's that's right. Um, that's also why in, in my previous study I, I, I choose that 8 degree heating weeks threshold which is high but then also that it had to happen at least 10, 10 years in a row. It, it is hard to imagine the enormous temperature stresses that, that corals are going to experience in the next 100 years if we keep tracking on uh, the RCP 8.5 emission scenario to uh, imagine that, that, that they can withstand degree heating weeks of, of, of 30 uh, or something which is what's projected in the next, uh, in the next 60, 70 years under RCP 8.5. So yes, adaptation might occur. Will, will it change the outcome drastically? I don't think so, but it, indeed it's an area of debate. Um, well, let's let's think a little bit about what we can do at this at this stage. Um, what how can how can us as every you know everyday everyday people? Um, how can reef, ma reef managers help? Um, can you both address beyond um, working together to reduce emissions? How we might be able to give coral reefs um, a, a more of a boost to, uh, for for increasing their resilience in the face of the future change that is going to un unfold. Well, one of the things that we can do is minimize any any local impacts that we do have. Uh, minimize pollution on a reef, which can, might contribute to diseases uh, or or eutrophication, extra nutrients in the water, which might also contribute to uh, diseases. Make sure that the fish stock is. Uh, uh, you know, keeps up so that we have enough herbivores so that the algae are being eaten on the reef uh, making sure that there's no anchor damage from ships which can be easily done with buoys um, we can make sure that there's no ship groundings by maybe closing it off there, there's local we can reduce the local stressors on a reef so that the reef has maximum capacity to withstand whatever comes its way Another thing that uh, some people are doing 
is actively growing new corals in coral nurseries and planting them out on the reef. Uh, that's also something that we can do. Uh, Mark, any other suggestions? Yeah, and, and you know, let's not forget that this is really a one-two punch we've got to deal with. We have to deal with the fact that we're, we're releasing huge amounts of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels out into the atmosphere. It's also causing feedback of other things, releasing methanes and, and you know, a variety of these heat, heat trapping gases. So we've got to be dealing with that, but that's going to be really slow to turn around. The important thing is while we're working on that to give the corals a fighting chance, we really have to be doing these sorts of things that, that Ruben's talking about. The, the biggest other threats to coral reefs, uh, the, the impacts of, of harmful fishing or overfishing, especially removing the, the herbivores, the, the lawn mowers of the reef, the things like parrotfish and things that, that eat the algae and keep the reefs clean when bleaching events occur and allow reefs to recover. Uh, we have to work on making sure we're not dumping pollutants on the reef, whether it's sediments, whether it's nutrients, whatever it is. These are, are two of the biggest things we have to worry about other than climate change, which, you know, the other thing we haven't talked about but is, is important as well at the same time is as the CO2 arises in the atmosphere, it's slowing the growth of, of corals because of ocean acidification. And, you know, we, we're really dealing with these, ver these climate effects, the fishing, the habitat effects, the, the uh, pollutants, and, and we've got to be hitting all of them as much as we can. And uh, you mentioned ocean acidification. Um, um, the, Ruben, the uh, impacts of ocean acidification are not going to follow those regional patterns that we are seeing for bleaching, correct? Where ocean acidification is a more uniform effect given the fact that uh, uh, it's acidifying more uniformly as opposed to temperature, which has regional differences. Is that right? Well, of course, there's also uh, there's always uh, regional differences with the uh, acidification too. Areas with upwelling are naturally more uh, acidic than than areas where you don't have upwelling. Okay. So, so that, yes, there are some patterns. But uh, another interesting way of looking at that is looking at okay, so when it, when do we foresee that these reefs are not going to look like anything that they look like now anymore? You know, the onset of annual bleaching. And so if you take that pattern where around the equator, those reefs, they'll bleach much sooner than further away from the equator. Then those reefs that, uh, that we previously identified as temporary refugia for bleaching, now they have so much more time to experience the, the effects of acidification. And the ocean has so much more time to take up the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, so those uh, actually those locations will be impacted more by acidification than the locations near the equator, just yeah. because those reefs are likely to persist longer. Mark, Ruben, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we didn't get to? Uh, go snorkel and scuba dive now, and go uh, enjoy the reefs. They're beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, these really are spectacular places. There's a reason why people are so concerned about coral reefs. These are among the most beautiful uh, places on Earth. Uh, the, the, often the reference is made to these being the rainforests of the sea. That's the wrong reference. There's more diversity in, rain for, in coral reefs than there is in rainforests. So we should be looking at the rainforests as the coral reefs of the land. Great. Let's turn that around. All right, everybody. Um, well, thank you for everybody who's joined us today. Um, uh, any image or uh, series of images that you saw, we are happy to share that with you. If you reach out to us on our Google Plus page or uh, write um, mindyw at aminh.org with a query, we can send particular images for you to use in your education programming. And we're happy to also answer any other questions or um, help with any other points that you'd like to get some more resources on. Um, just please let us know. We're happy to share. OK, so thanks, everybody. Um, we are going to be um, releasing another visualization in our series in uh, about two months. So we will reach out to you when we have another Hangout to uh, explore that a little bit more deeply. And uh, thank you again for joining us. And thanks, Mark. Thanks, Ruben.
Thank Appreciate you. Having you here. Thank you.